Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from the break. I hope you had a good break. Thank you for coming back so promptly after that break. Uh, I hope also the first session of your workshops went well. How was that? Yeah, yeah. all right, yeah, good, excellent. Right, um, we have now two presentations in the area of open access models and impacts. And as I said before, we've reversed the, um, the order of these two kind of for technical reasons because uh, uh, Solomon is uh, still in Nairobi, so we're going to do this through uh, the wonders of the internet. Um, so, uh, again, I'm not going to give you a big intro. The people, you can read their bios in the program. But just to say that Solomon's going to be talking about um, Research for Life and OA. He's uh, quite an expert on kind of electronic content in Africa. Um, and then Tasha's going to talk about um, the work that she's been doing on uh, open access models within a society publisher. So I'm hoping that if we now switch over to Solomon, and he's going to know that we're ready to go, and he's just having a glass of water, he may know that we're ready to go. Solomon, are you there? No, he's run off. <laughs> so I'm just going to wave at him, because I think I can see him, and go, go. Up, oh, there we go. I'm hoping he's going to start, ready to start. Okay. Yes, good morning. Uh, this uh, electronic presentation is uh, on the impact of free or low cost access to e-resources on research in Africa, the case of Research for Life. Uh, I'm a chemist and not uh, a librarian, so the presentation will be guided by the impact of free uh, or low-cost access to scientific journal has on my research as a scientist in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and by extension to others uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. The presentation will narrow on uh, research for life as it will uh, adequately represent both subscription and, uh, and open-based access to library resources. Um, the presentation will start by providing historical background information on libraries, universities, and research in Africa so that you can see why the continent needed research for life program in the first place and will continue to depend on these in the near future to conduct meaningful research. Uh, in uh, Africa, just like the rest of the world, has been a center of learning and research. To highlight uh, some of this, let's look at four examples. The first one, is Tumbuktu in Mali. The university in Tumbuktu, uh, established in the 12th century, had 700,000 collections of manuscripts and books uh, in the areas of uh, Islamic studies, geography, mathematics, and medicine. The other one, which all of us are aware of, is the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. The oldest university and library, which is still in operation, is found in Africa, in Morocco. Similar centers of excellence existed elsewhere in, in, in Africa. One such example is Ethiopia, which in about 650 AD uh, illustrated the oldest and most complete Bible, the Garima uh, Gospels. Um, coming back uh, to the 19th century, uh, uh, these are the, the ones you see shaded are uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, with the exception of uh, uh, the discussion I'm going to have, it, it, it will be with the ex exception of South Africa. By 1944, which is toward the end of the Second World War, uh, many African uh, countries were still under colonialism. By then, there were only six universities in Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding uh, South Africa. Six universities for 49 countries in Africa. 
So majority of the universities, the way we know them in Africa, were established after independence. These are some of the, the universities that were established after independence. The initial mandate of these universities was training of the professional that are required to run the independent state apparatus of the newly uh, formed government. That is in a training of uh, uh, civil servants, teachers, uh, medical officers, and law enforcement officers. And almost there was no much research that was done during that period. It is only after these initial needs were made that uh, research was included as part of the mandate of universities in Africa. So I will give you uh, in the next period, the period from 1980 to 87, the period for which I have uh, some data. Uh, as you are aware, immediately after in independence, there was a lot of enthusiasm in Africa. Uh, many Af uh, Africans were building our future is in, in our hand. We can take uh, it to, to whatever level we need. And uh, the economies of many African countries were doing very well. And uh, there was uh, investment that was put on universities, laboratories were built, and uh, universities were subscribing to journals. And the result of that was immediate. In the, between the period 1980 to 87, there was uh, a, a growth in the publication output of scientists from Sub-Saharan Africa. So much so, in 1987, the output from Sub-Saharan scientists from Sub-Saharan Africa reached 1%. This milestone was achieved in 1987. You, you might have come across some literature. Some people still think in, uh, even as, uh, in, even in 2020, so many will think, think that uh, percent, the scientific output of Africa is only 1%. So this milestone was achieved in 1987, but this was not sustained. It was followed by a period of decline, the 80s and 90s, a period of lost opportunity for research, uh, periods of economic decline. And most of the countries in Africa depended on donor funding. And, uh, and he who pays uh, the, uh, dictates the outcome. So because of that, there was a structure uh, adjustment programs that were imposed by the World Bank and IMF, and this resulted in reduced public expenditure. And the most important casualty of this were universities. There was a reduction of funding for universities in favor of basic education. Many of the universities in Sub-Saharan Africa were thrown in, in financial crisis. Uh, the, the universities were forced to introduce austerity measures to make matters worse. Without commissariate increase in funding, they were forced to increase enrollment, student enrollment. So funding for laboratories and libraries were reduced. As a result, conducting meaningful research was very, very difficult. Uh, journal subscription was stopped. For example, at University of Nairobi in Kenya, journal subscri subscription was stopped in 1989. This, I believe, the case in many other sub-Saharan African countries. The consequence of this has been, as a result of this, sub-Saharan Africa share of world scientific papers declined from what was what it was uh, uh, one percent that it was in 1987 to 0 0.7 in 1996. Indeed, a period of lost opportunity. There was so much in the era of research that has happened during the 1980s and the 1990s all over the world. So, um, so what has been the challenges of uh, doing research in Africa in, in pre-research for life in open access, open access era? I'll just give you my personal journey. I did my graduate studies 
MSc as well as PhD at the University of Nairobi, MSc in 97, PhD in 2004, like many other African uh, uh, young scientists who's uh, seen the challenges the continent uh, was facing, I was really eager to participate in uh, research, but uh, insufficient research, as you are aware, is a hurdle to growth and development. That's why many of us wanted to be involved in research so that we can uh, conduct research to solve local challenges and in the process also contribute to global knowledge. knowledge. But this requires standing on the shoulders of giants. You remember subscription at the University of Nairobi was stopped in 1989 following the structure adjustment program. So as a result, furthering knowledge is very difficult. One has to go through a lot of hassle to, to access scientific literature. Like myself, I was sponsored by the German Academic Exchange uh, uh, Service to conduct uh, my PhD. And then as part of this, I had uh, the opportunity of going to Germany for six months to access their latest uh, equipment. But most of the time, uh, I spent on accessing the literary literature so, so that I can write a meaningful thesis and also publications. So a survey that was adopted by WHO in 2000 showed that 56% of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa or the least developing countries had no current sub subscription to any international journal. It is at this point, around the year 2000, with, uh, that many uh, in the West, guided by the United Nations, started worrying about how is it possible for us to organize ourselves to have uh, uh, scientific literature available to African uh, countries. And that's when the Research for Life program was established. Africa, as you know, is, is 1.3 billion strong, the majority of whom are young, capable of uh, pulling the continent up, uh, pulling out of the myriad of the different challenges it's facing. This is my PhD student, uh, Moses, from uh, Uganda. He's very smart and intelligent. He can, with, uh, uh, with adequate resources, can contribute towards uh, uh, achieving either the Millennium Development Goals as they were then known, now the SDGs, but this requires, uh, uh, in order to do this, uh, the barriers to conducting research must be overcome, one of those being access to scientific literature. So it is in this background, initiative, several initiatives were put uh, up, as I told you, by different UN bodies to, in, to bridge the gap in access to scientific literature between the developed and the developing world. Uh, that's how the research program, the Research for Life program came into be. Uh, the Research for Life program is a collective name of five public-private partnership, uh, Hinari, Agora, ORA, uh, ARD, and Goali. These, together with publishing houses and universities uh, in the US, uh, uh, organized uh, literature in five thematic areas in the areas of health, agriculture, innovation, and law. As a result of this program, uh, scientists in sub-Saharan Africa can have access to 85,000 journals, books, and uh, databases. These empowered libraries in Africa to support research like never before. There was no university anywhere in, in Africa had such uh, large access to scientific uh, literature. So the, there are two categories of countries that are uh, eligible for Research for Life program. The one shown uh, in uh, blue color, the one and the one shown in red. The one shown in blue are uh, the Group A countries, about 69 of them. These ones have access, free access to scientific literature. The Group B countries, the North African countries, uh, Nigeria, Gabon, uh, Botswana, and Namibia in Africa, this one can, can have access to the Research for Life uh, program 
through a nominal uh, fee of USD 1,500 per annum. These are the number of uh, some of the publication, publication houses that have made their uh, scientific uh, articles available through the Research for Life program. Close to nine, 195 publishers have participated in this program. Uh, one of those, the new coming to the four, is the Royal, the Royal Society of Chemistry. I'm very excited about the chemist. I am now able to access all the journals of the Royal Society of Chemistry for free. Uh, what has the impact of the Research for Life program has been on research in Africa? One, uh, access to research journals has improved like never before, as, uh, as I told you. Currently, we can access to about 85,000 journals through this program. The other thing is, the, because of this access, the institutional capacity of universities in sub-Saharan Africa is much improved to support research. And, then, uh, and further, researchers in, in Africa can now engage in state of the, the state of uh, the art research with uh, shoulders of giant uh, to stand on. And it's also possible they can also be engaged in writing journal articles and reviews in high impact journals. Uh, what has the impact of the Research for Life been in terms of the scientific output of scientists from uh, African countries? As you can see, from the year 96, 2002, there was no much activity in terms of publication uh, in the whole of Africa. It is only after 2002 that you can see uh, a, a major increase. And this was the year when the Research for Life program was uh, established through Hinari and the others. And then this has tremendously improved, as you can see, the overall publication output of African countries. Even in terms of the percentage share of uh, African uh, publication from African uh, scientists, it has increased from about 1% that was in 1996 to 2.2% um, to in uh, 2012, more than a percentage increase. Uh, this is uh, there is another uh, research done to uh, compare uh, the the publication uh, trend profile of scientists in uh, in uh, Africa before the introduction of uh, the Research for Life program, the period 1996-2002, and then after five years after the introduction of the uh, the Research for Life, as you can see. If you compare the scientists in non-research for life program before 96, their publication output was more than those in the research for life program. But after the research for life program is uh, introduced, the uh, publication output of the scientists in uh, uh, sub-Saharan Afri Africa uh, dramatically improved. Uh, another research that was uh, conducted to cover uh, publication coming from Africa uh, in the period 2005-2016 showed that in this period, there has been a steady increase in scientific output of uh, African scientists. So my so between the year 2005 and 2016, the scientific output of African scientists doubled from 1.5% that was in 2005 to 3.2% in 2016. So as you could clearly see, the Research for Life program has a great impact on the research output of science, African scientists. Uh, what are the, the challenges of open access in Africa. The Research for Life program provides access to this for free, but to, to get that free information, there are, some, uh, there are some things that need to be put in place. One of them is 
access to internet. Uh, the percentage internet per penetration in Africa is the worst. It stands, if you compare the different regions of the world, it stands at uh, 40%. The situation is imp improving much, uh, very much. If you look at Kenya, the percentage of Kenyan population that served by internet is about 90% at the moment. Uh, so it is a challenge, but it's a challenge that is increasingly being addressed. The other one is the high cost of internet in Africa. As you know, Africans are the poorest and but internet access is the most expensive for example the internet uh, i have uh, to i'm using to connect with you this uh, afternoon it cost me about 57 dollars per month this probably i can afford because i'm a, a university lecturer but I, but you can uh, understand the majority of researchers the majority of our students will find it difficult to access. Even if we overcome access uh, and also cost, there's still another challenge. The other challenge is lack of awareness. I've conducted a number of awareness program in many universities in Kenya and in the region. Uh, my discussion with uh, the academics as well as the postgraduate students is that many of them are not aware of the existence of the Research for Life program. Even myself, I only came to learn about the Research for Life program after I have completed my PhD in 2004. Uh, even in those countries where the information is available, the usage pattern of uh, the Research for Life has not been consistent. Here you see an orange and blue bar. First of all, there is no much difference between the two bars. The, the blue represents the, the period 2018-19. The orange represents the period 2017-18 to 18 in terms of uh, how many times this res the Research for Life program is accessed. And then you see in some countries like Kenya, Nigeria, the, the, they had access to the Research for Life program the previous year compared to this. So there has been a decline. So there is need for sustained uh, awareness uh, to make sure that uh, the researchers in, uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa are aware of the program and can continue to benefit from it. So uh, how can we improve um, the reach of the Research for Life program? I have some suggestions to make. One of them uh, is to persuade more partners to join the program. By the time I started using uh, the program, I used to access Elsevier publications, but from Kenya at the moment, I, I, we do not have access to this. So let's bring more uh, partners to come so that scientists in Africa will see research for life program is a one-stop access to scientific information. The other thing is uh, to recruit and train Research for Life ambassadors and champions that continue to create awareness about the existence of the program, probably also train young uh, scientists on how to use the resources. Of course, it's very important to have sustained awareness uh, campaign. In my belief, some of the spikes we, we saw in certain years and decline in the other years is, is because most of the time uh, it is graduate students who access such kind of information. And probably there must have been some awareness campaign that was conducted during uh, that time. And then you see a spike the moment those students uh, complete their studies and um, you will see a decline. So uh, it is very important that we reach out to graduate students in all the universities through the graduate schools or the Board of Postgraduate Studies, whichever, whatever, however they are known. Um, it is possible to approach the graduate school and through the graduate school, we should conduct annual 
uh, awareness program by using the Research for Life ambassadors and champions. The other thing we need to do is conduct discipline specific uh, uh, training and aware awareness piggybacking on uh, scientific events. So it's, it will be good if you have, uh, if you could conduct subject specific, for example, in the area of physics. What are resource, what resources are available in the area of physics, in the area of mathematics, in the area of uh, medicine, so that the, this scientist can see and also it can be exhaustively um, uh, trained on those specific dis disciplines. So be before I finish, let me share with you about my own campaign uh, on to make sure uh, scientists in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, have awareness about uh, e-library resources that are available through the Research for Life program. So I've been conducting uh, seminars on e-library resources, as well as on citation and reference management tool using Zotero as an example. I was uh, exposed to the Research for Life program through a proposal writing workshop I attended uh, organized by the German Academic Exchange. That was the first time I got exposed to the Research for Life program. This may be three, four years after I finished my PhD. I got very much interested. I studied and learned more about this. And then the DAD engaged me in conducting uh, awareness and training program. I did uh, training in Rwanda, Sudan, and Tanzania. And then later on, through the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Pan-African Chemistry, I've conducted several uh, awareness or training in Nairobi at the University of Nairobi, Kisi University, Kabianga University, Maseno University. These are uh, universities at different corners of, uh, of Kenya. And I have done several repeat uh, seminars at the University of Nairobi. Just on the 14th of February on Valentine's Day, uh, I, I held a similar, a similar seminar at the University of Nairobi. And in, in the recent past, uh, I will have, uh, on the 5th of March, there will, I will conduct a seminar at Taita Taveta University towards the coastal region of, region of Kenya. And another one on 8th May at Bondo University towards uh, Lake Victoria. These are supported by the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Pan-African chemistry network. Uh, I would uh, like to finish my presentation by acknowledging the German Academic uh, Exchange Service that in the first place exposed me to the Research for Life program, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Pan-African Chemistry Network, the organizers of this conference, the Research to Reader, my university, and uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and you, who been patient enough despite the challenges, been keen to follow my presentation. Thank you very much. That's um, that excellent presentation uh, delivered from Nairobi. He was hoping to be with us today, but unfortunately had to do it, uh, do it remotely. So um, I'd just like to uh, once again thank him and I'll turn the camera around so you can, he can see the appreciation as well from you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.